museum and gallery, but our teams are very closely connected. I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, I have been invited today to talk about our Recollect site, which we've called the Fairfield City Heritage Collection. I want to be upfront, I'm not being paid by Recollect to be here. We are paying them quite a lot of money to run up. So <laughs> I want to give you an honest sort of insight in what it's like to have a Recollect page, how it worked for us, talk about pros and cons, and also give you the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, and yeah, like I said, I've talked to Tyler before. He knows what I'm going to be talking about roughly, but I'm going to be quite honest what worked well for us and what didn't work so well for us as well. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard of Fairfield before, we are a local government area in Sydney Southwest. Another area of um, concern during lockdowns. I'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, we're based on direct country um, and we have a great local heritage team um, fronted by Marilyn Gallo, who might be familiar to some of you because she's part of the network and part of the committee organizing today. Um, and our sort of recollect project started back in 2019. We had a restructure and that is how our two teams came together. So we have the heritage services team, which is Marilyn and two colleagues and a museums and gallery team. Um, we were put together, which actually worked out really well for us. Um, so it was the coming together of a team with different skills, different experiences, and also the coming together of two different collections. We had our local studies collection and a museum object collection. So to give you an idea, our local studies collection um, has a total of 27,770 items, Marilyn told me, um, over 20,000 photographs, video, audio files, newspaper clippings, and archival and ephemeral material. And the museum collection is a solid collection of over 3,000 objects capturing the area's local history. So I started right at the start of our Recollect adventure um, in 2019. Um, at that stage, both the library, local history, um, heritage services and the museum didn't have any public facing page or collection. Um, the library was using spiders, it's been mentioned a few times, which does have the capacity to have some images online, but it's not really easily searchable. It's not a great platform to quickly share things. Um, they had a heritage blog on WordPress, which worked OK, but it took a lot of effort from the staff to maintain it. Um, the museum didn't have anything. Um, we have an in-house collection management system on Mosaic, but no public facing sort of presence for our collection. Um, so yeah, Council committed to the purchase of Recollect in 2019, um, and it really was their idea to make a, a history hub or a heritage hub for the community, but also for wider audiences, people who wanted to research local history. Um, so yeah, this is what we ended up building. This is what it looks like now, and I will take you to the live site a little bit later. Um, it took a lot of work to get here. And um, as the Recollect guys mentioned before, you do workshops. Someone from New Zealand came out to Fairfield, stayed in a local motel for a few days, did workshops with us. And to be honest, we were very overwhelmed. Um, we were a small team of people with no prior experience in any sort of web development or even, you know, maintaining any sort of website. And I started working there a few months before and all I was thinking is this is way too much work. Like, how were we going? This was a mistake. I'm not going to lie. That's what we, we thought. Um, the, the language that they used was very developer heavy. They used things like ingesting data and we were just, I don't know what that is. Um, user types, metadata, that was something we were familiar with, but, you know, we talked about cataloging and the whole idea of structuring collection from our sort of experience is very different than coming from these guys. And it took a long time to adjust to each other. Um, so what we did, we did the workshops with them, the question is, but then we kind of took it in house. We were like, all right, build us a simple website, but now we want to do our own thinking. So we went back to the team, sat down, and we started mind mapping and just working on big sheets of paper. And it was actually a really good exercise in kind of figuring out the strengths of the collection and the things that we thought were important. And from experience, the things that people were interested in coming to the library or to the museum, things that they wanted to access and thinking about the different layers that exist within your collections, because this was an opportunity to kind of start from scratch. 
in building a digital presence for our collection. So this is just something that I found yesterday in um, our own records. Um, and I remember doing this, you know, on Word building this little mind map, but it works to give you an idea of the sorts of collections that we had, and they'll probably be very similar to what you're working with and thinking about the hierarchy. Now, I think in libraries and in museums as well, we think kind of top down, very linear. You have, you know, your top record and you go down and it becomes more detailed and kind of finer grained. But what Recollect does, and it's actually a really great tool, is it allows you, apologies for my crap um, PowerPoint skills, but these are the only errors I can find. It allows you to link kind of from left to right, from top to bottom, but also diagonally. So you can put a record in and every record lives by itself in a virtual space and you can hang it under a collection, but then you can also cross link it to another item that sits in another collection and have it pop up in a third, fourth, fifth space. And that is a really intuitive way of searching. Um, and we find that our users and also us as users, um, as a staff, find it really helpful and things actually pop up in ways that we never thought of. And we find connections within our collections that we didn't realize were there. So that's a really good tool. Um, and like I said, this whole exercise of sitting down, mind mapping, talking to the team was just really fun for us to do as well. Um, we came to the conclusion that we really wanted Recollect to be a showcase of our most valuable, significant items. We didn't want it to replace our existing collection management systems. We had no intention of migrating everything onto Recollect. And I'm really glad we made that decision because I think it saved us a lot of time. Um, we did initially attempt that. We tried to retrieve all our data from spiders and from Mosaic and do mass migration, and it just didn't work. Um, our records didn't match the templates. I know that <laughs> you struggled with that a lot, Michelle, as well. And I can only imagine having bigger collections like the City of Sydney archives. They had to migrate so many things across. And that is very, very time consuming. So think about that before you start doing it. For us, um, because we have a relatively small collection, we decided for Recollect to only be a showcase of our most significant items to really kind of scrutinize what would go on there and then manually upload every record. So everything that you see on Recollect, every um, record has been created by me or one of my colleagues. Um, then lockdown happened. This was the first lockdown in um, back in 2020. And it was actually a really, really great thing to happen for us um, because it gave us time to work on Recollect and only work on Recollect for three months. Um, so we turned our gallery space into um, a photo studio. We chose 250 objects from the museum collection, photographed them all, because we thought if we're going to showcase only our best objects, we want to have good photos. We didn't before, so we got um, Jennifer Leahy from Silver Salt in. She helped us, and we did um, three solid days of photographing, and we got 250 objects photographed. Um, and I think it made all the difference because it just looks really professional, if I may say so myself. Um, so yeah, at the end of the lockdown, um, we had a first sort of version of the website up. So these objects are from our collection and this is what they look like. Um, and then we did a, um, a launch. We had a little, no, I'm forgetting something very important actually. Before we launched it, we decided to do a round of feedback. And I know some of you here, definitely some people attending online, were actually in our test group. So we had our first version of the website up. We emailed it through Ellen and others out to some in the network here today and asked for feedback. And we also asked our local history group. We asked schools. We asked some of our volunteers to do a test run and to give us really honest feedback about navigating the website, what they thought worked, what didn't work. And then we kind of fine tuned it before we launched it. And I thought that was really, really helpful. And I was actually really um, yeah, surprised by how many people jumped on board and were able to give us their time and thoughts and help us make a better website. So we did that and then we came to the launch and um, we were pretty excited by the results because these are some of our stats um, since we launched it in June 2020. So these are the sessions that we have a month and you can see the numbers are really a lot higher than what we ever expected. 
Um, so we get, you know, sometimes over 70,000 people visiting the website a month. We definitely didn't get that many people through the door in our library and the museum. So really good to see, really heartening to see and kind of, you know, means it's worthwhile what we've been doing, basically. Yeah. Um, we have some more stats available. Tyler kind of talked about it before. So you can have quick stats that are just on the back end of your website. You can go into them easily, but you can also look at Google Analytics and it tells you really detailed the behavior of your audiences. So you can see where they're coming from. We have people coming from overseas, how much time they're spending on the pages, what they're doing, what they're most interested in. The historical photographs are always our biggest hit. I don't think that's really a surprise to anyone. But what we found was, for example, um, a COVID project that we did was really, really successful as well. And people actually spend time looking at the photographs that were submitted um, and reading all the contributions. So it gives you that sort of feedback. Um, I think I might just go to the live site. So see if I can do that from here. Popped it up before. Ellen, can people see that too? Yes. All right. So we've got our um, acknowledgement popping up. We had to push for that a little bit, but you can do that now if you have recollect. And then this is our live website. So everyone can obviously, you know, format their web page um, however they want it to look. We have one sort of item feature that changes when you refresh the page. Of course, it won't do it when I try to do it here. Basically, you can single out items that you want featured and it'll change every time you go. Then we have a search bar and we've kept our homepage really, really basic. So there's a search bar and then we have 10 collections that we highlight. Um, and these we can easily change depending on, you know, what's current. So at the moment we have our historical photographs, um, local history resources, the museum collection. We also have a small art collection within council. Um, the oral histories down at the bottom here and council minutes, for example. But you can already see we also have a record of some of our previous social history collections and military collection, which wasn't a collection that existed as such before Recollect, but we were just able to link different things that we could categorize as military related and kind of curate this online collection. So I might go to that one first. So like I said, we never had a military collection as such. We just thought, oh, we've got, you know, objects relating to the wars and local soldiers, efforts at the home front. We've got oral histories with local war veterans. Um, we had records on local soldiers. We had a couple of publications, photographs. Why don't we put them all together? And when doing that, we thought, hmm, actually, we do have quite a few things. So we ended up writing a grant, getting a grant, from the Veterans Affairs, got some researchers to do some more in-depth research and actually enhance our collection in that way. So that was one of the things that we probably wouldn't have, uh oh, snooze, um, that we wouldn't have picked up on if we didn't have this website. If I go back to the home page, historical photographs, just to show you what it looks like. Um, they pop up kind of in order of uploading. We currently have 512. So like I said, out of 20,000, it's really only a snapshot and they are being entered manually. So it is a really slow moving process. Um, and that is probably one of the biggest cons or things to keep in mind with Recollect. It just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources um, in terms of purchasing it, but you need to have the staff available. And we find that, you know, with our everyday work, it's not really something that I do as part of my core job. I do it if I can. Um, Marilyn spends a lot of um, time on it, but yeah, you need to have staff available to kind of keep the momentum going. Otherwise, it will just become a dead platform. So we're slowly adding stuff to it. Um, the photographs we talked about a little bit earlier, you can upload them in high res, which is great. Um, we accidentally even put some really heavy TIFF files on there and it still worked. We have since replaced them with high res JPEG because it was getting a bit 
too slow, um, but you can have high res and we have enabled our download function. So anyone can click in and then just hit download and we don't charge. You can download the high res files from there. You can also see in this one, it allows you to showcase more than one item per record. So we've done that a few times where items are linked and this is you know, very different from your cataloging that you're used to. These are just all sitting there in the same record because they're related. And we figured from a user perspective, this is how people want to see things. So we kept going back to how do our users want to use the website, not what is the industry standard or what have we been taught when we were studying to be librarians or historians. Um, and it's been really fun because it enables you to be a lot more free. Um, we don't have to, you know, adhere to all the conventions. Um, we can be a little bit more free in writing our descriptions. And uh, like we said before, you can link from left to right. If you think something is related, you can just link it all up. Um, showcase our museum collection as well. So here are some of the items. And the same when you open them up you'll see more than one image. So you can have all the images here. And then a description here. Um, some of our exhibitions, now this is very much a work in progress. Um, I'm hoping to add all our previous social history exhibitions. I've gotten to about four now. But it is a really nice way to capture content that you've created and worked hard on and share it with people. Um, so for example, we did an exhibition called Treasures from Home back in 2019, 2020, um, where we asked local residents to come forward with their stories of migration and showcase objects that they brought with them. Um, so you can have the text there, but we've also linked the text panels, for example. So. I might click on open and then there's a PDF with the text panel. And if I go further down, we also have the oral history interviews that we did on video. So for example, here is Albert Oshana, his oral history interview, and the video is embedded straight away into the website. So you've got PDFs, you've got video files, audio files, photographs, anything, and it's just really user friendly. You can play this. I'm not sure if the audio is working, but that's all right. When you go onto the website. So remember Albert, for example, he's sitting here. We came there by going to the exhibitions, then drill down to a specific exhibition, and his oral history was linked to that, um, but he'll pop up somewhere else as well. If I go to our oral history collection and we've actually found that the oral history is our second pop, most popular after our historical photographs. Um, Marilyn has done a really, really amazing job collecting over 250 over the last 20 odd years. Um, we've categorized them based on um, projects, but we also have all oral histories available here. Uh, more recent video interviews are listed here. So you'll see there is Albert again, but he is also in our Treasures from Home interviews and you'll also find him in all oral history. So like I said, there's multiple ways to end up with the same record. And when I click one of them open, so I'll just go to all oral histories. For most of the ones that we have available, we have um, a short description, then a summary of the interview, which is great if you want it to be searchable. And then a transcript, which opens up again as a PDF in the PDF viewer. And then we have the actual recording as well. And then you can see this recording, you can play it here, but on the left it's linked again to the transcript and also to the oral history. So for one person's oral history, you don't just create one 
record, you create this page, which is basically an information page, which has the photo, the summary, but then you also create a page for the transcript and a page for the um, audio recording. For some of our audio recordings, we have up to five or six files. So that means for one oral history, sometimes we have to create one sort of landing page, six pages for each of the recordings and then six pages for each of the transcripts. So again, it is a lot of work. Um, and that's how we chose to do it. Other places have done it differently, um, but yeah, that's how we've done it and it is a lot of work. A fun feature because, um, yeah, like I said, recollect your can be a bit more free than um, a data management system or a catalog. It allows you to do community engagement projects and we've already heard of a few today. Um, we had our own one. Fairfield definitely being one of the areas singled out during the lockdown. We wanted to capture what, f what daily life was like um, for the people living in our LGA. So we came up with our stories, Fairfield's daily life during COVID-19, where we asked people to share images um, that kind of captured what they were doing, things that they noticed, and we got lots and lots of contributions. Um, People that randomly heard about it through social media, um, local advertising in a newspaper, word of mouth. Um, we connected with local schools. One of our local TAVEs that runs um, an English program for new migrants and refugees actually did a writing exercise on it. So, for example, the birthday cake here was contributed by a student, Rania, who took a photo of a birthday cake that she made for her husband. Um, so we've got a little quote, make the cake for my husband. Um, she wanted it to be a funny memory. So she made the cake and painted mask and hand sanitizer on it, as well as the phrase stay at home. Um, they're just really little snippets and relatively easy for us to put them up. So we haven't added them to our collection. They haven't been catalogued, but they can live on Recollect and they're really easily accessible. Um, for people wanting to have a look. And we got, again, really great responses from our community. People got really creative, um, some beautiful photos um, of, you know, life in lockdown. The good sides of it, the bad sides of it. And then one last thing I thought I'd show you is that we can have collections within collections. So you can kind of be as creative as you want to be. So in local history resources, where we've kind of dumped everything that you might need when you're doing local history research. So we've got the Sandstick um, directory, we've got Rosarian, which is um, the annual magazine of one of the local schools. We've got information on mayors and councillors. We've got some of our publications, the council minutes as well. Quickly show them. Um, we haven't put all of them up, but we're in the process of putting them up. But something new that we're working on, and this is very new, um, is working with local community and offering Recollect as a platform for them to showcase their collections. And this is a real collaboration between, again, the museum and the local studies um, team. We have a lot of multicultural communities in Fairfield, and um, we found that the the sort of material that we get offered for donation comes from one specific demographic within our LGA. It's often um, people with white Anglo backgrounds whose family is already represented in the collection and they just keep coming in with more photographs and more things. And we say yes, because they are an important part of our collection. So we keep collecting the same stories, um, but we feel like more and more people are not represented. And we're trying to tackle that in different ways, um, but something that we're interested in is working with community and actually, you know, going to these groups and asking, what would you like? And what we found is that there is a real reluctance within um, especially non-Western communities to hand over things to an archive or a local studies collection or a museum because, you know, you're a government organisation, you have no connection to that group. It's much better off being cared for and looked after by the people that know about it um, to stay within a certain family. So we're kind of moving away from that idea of wanting to 
collect things physically and put them in our storeroom and put them in our databases, but actually going to a community and saying, what do you already have and how can we help you showcase that? So we're currently working with the Assyrian community, which is a really large community in Fairfield, um, to put their collection online. We've made this public, even though it is very much still in progress. So you see some question marks there. This is to show you today and also for us to show the community what we can offer. Um, but things that we can link to are oral histories. Um, so they've already come up with a list of people that they want to interview and want to add to that. Um, we have photographs. We only have a few, but they've got a great collection. So we'll get scans from them and just showcase the digital um, version of that. They've made publications. We've got some objects. Um, this is the whole um, another collection that we did previously. But there's, for example, Albert Oshana again, um, who you saw before coming from the Treasures from Home. And I have to say so far, the Syrian community or well, the representatives that we've been speaking with are really, really excited about this. Um, they're a really international community as well, so it allows them to share the local Fairfield and New South Wales sort of content with their people overseas, in America, in um, Iraq. Um, and I think for us, this is looking like a really promising sort of feature of, um, of Recollect and something that we definitely want to keep exploring into the future. Something else that we want to do that we haven't really been able to um, do is to migrate content from the blog across because we still have the old WordPress blog. People do find their way there and have questions, but we're hoping to put that into Recollect so there can be a blog feature on there. Um, but yeah, we need more time. We probably need more training as well. So it's interesting that Taylor mentioned that because um, I definitely feel like I need a refresher. Like I said, I don't have a background in websites at all um, and neither do my colleagues. So it'll be really good to get that training again. And that is probably my biggest sort of advice for the people that haven't purchased Recollect or another similar platform is to really think about your staff's capacity to actually do it. Because it sounds great and they have a great sales page. But if you don't have people to implement it and to keep it going, um, it's a lot of money. Yeah, so kind of to sum it all up, and then I'm happy for you to ask some questions, is that for us it is a really great platform to have all our digital content in the one place. It makes it so much easy, easier to answer inquiries. You can just direct them to the website often, share a link rather than having to send over heavy files. All our local publications are in there, so rather than sending the heavy PDF or having to scan pages, you can just say, follow this link, and on that page you'll find your answer. Um, you're not restricted by the cataloging parameters, um, but it is really important to think about how you're structuring your website so it stays sort of clear and easy to navigate. Um, good opportunity for community engagement, the sharing of high resolution images. Recollect has been really good in providing help. So if you have a question um, or if there's even a feature that doesn't exist yet, but you think would be helpful, they will look into that. Um, and you have different settings, so you can put things up. So, for example, the Assyrian um, Ashurbanipal collection, I've made it online now to show you, but I'll put it back to private when we finish so that the general public can't see it and only the people that have created a login can. So we can share it with the community, people that we want, but other people can't access it yet. Um, then the cons, I've said it four times now, resources and staff time. It is a really big investment. I think the initial purchase for us was $23,000 and then we're on a contract for twelve or $13,000 a year. Um, and that's, I think, one of the smaller packages that they have available. Um, we have a small team. We have about three people at the museum and gallery and three people in the library team. And we all have other jobs that we tend to do first before we look at Recollect. Um, and for us, one of the big things was that we were thinking we could migrate everything across, but we couldn't. So now we're uploading everything one by one. So yeah, hope that gives you a bit of insight. <laughs> I see you guys nodding all the time. Are there a lot of other people that have Recollect already? What are you, how are you finding it? <laughs> do you have a question? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, I'll come back to you. 
I'm just saying very time consuming and um, feel like we need more training to, to keep on top of it. Um, but it does have a lot of positives. So um, we're certainly glad we've got it. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's just uh, trying to keep on top of it all. <laughs> yeah. We have another question over here. Um, thank you. Um, Angela from Ride. We're on spiders and we're, we're looking to get Recollect. Um, are there any links from Recollect to your items in spiders? We haven't done that. Um, I know you can quite easily link to an external page. So in the strain, I think if I can think of something. For example, I know in our military collections, you can just provide a direct link to an external page, um, but we haven't done any of the cross-linking. So if you can see here external links. We haven't done any cross-linking to our catalog. And in your forward planning, are you looking um, to bring the items that are in spiders over gradually, or did you basically say um, only things after a certain date will be put into Recollect? Um, our plan moving forward is to kind of look at the collections within the collections. Um, so, for example, at the moment we're working on, um, again, looking at you, Michelle, at the Fairfax collection that we purchased um, and putting them up as part of the photographic collection. Um, and we've kind of earmarked collections within the collections and that's how we work because otherwise it's just too overwhelming. But I don't think we'll ever have a one-on-one -on -one duplicate of what's on spiders and what is on recollect and it's yeah not what we intend to do um i'm just going to kind of paraphrase an online question and add to it so the other things are on spiders how do people know which place to look and is there kind of like something on recollect that says hey we've got more on spiders and something on spiders that says we've hey we've got more on recollect how do people know that the two locations um that's a very good question I'm not entirely sure. How Perhaps I could um, just come in here. Um, it's done through what's called circular linking. So um, you can start in Spidus and be looking at an item in Spidus, which will take you straight through to the Recollect item. And vice versa, vice versa, you could be in um, uh, Recollect and that'll take you straight back through to Spidus. Oh, I see, which comes first in Google, in a Google search, is that what you're saying? Uh -huh. And I'm in the library catalogue. Yep. You'll and be. Right. Right. So unless it's in the op if you add an opac and you're 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 doing that search yeah. in Spidus, if it's in Spidus, you'll see it. Um, unless that opac has access to the wider internet, no, no, you won't see it. Yeah, so it needs to be in your library system first. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're at an OPAC looking, you know, ser searching the catalogue. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yep. So, yeah, I, we don't we don't really actively do that. So we've got basically a link to view our heritage collection online here in the library catalogue and it will take you to the home page of Recollect um, and vice versa in Recollect, you can go to the Open Libraries catalogue or the museum and gallery website. Um, but it's not something we've actively done. Just curious. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alinda. Um, so two questions, and one of them is related to the other one. Is Spider still your main catalogue and some things would be replicated in Recollect? That's correct. But everything is in Spider's as a cataloging, except for Mosaic, except you've got Mosaic. For They're the, two separate yeah. the logging systems for the museum collection and the library collection. Yeah. And they've kind of both been integrated with our sort of selection of the finest on Recollect. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then I was, this is a little bit off track, so you might want to take it later, but you mentioned the Fairfax photographs that you've purchased, because we've purchased Fairfax photographs at Bayside too but we didn't purchase the copyright. Yeah, so we've had quite a lot of negotiations with them and they've given us the okay to publish them if we have tried our best to contact the photographer. Um, 
what we're going to do is the ones that we do have the photographer um, contacts for, and we have contacted quite a few already, is to put a watermark on the image and have it up that way. But I'm sure Marilyn is happy to have a whole other session because I know a lot of you will be dealing with that. But Fairfax is quite open to it um, from what we understand. Uh, I would love to get the contact person that you've yep. been liaising with in Fairfax because I just keep hitting a, a oh, really? blank wall okay. yeah, or a uh, brick Marilyn. wall. Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you. Sorry. Are there any more questions? Roger from Reconnect would just like uh, to clarify a point or two, please. Thanks, Linda. That was a fantastic presentation, and I think it demonstrates really well what Recollect can do um, for a local studies collection. Just wanted to just kind of maybe touch on a couple of the points that you raised around the um, the resources that are required for Recollect, and um, I think Michelle would probably agree with this as well that um, you've all been part of a, an early evolution, if you like, of, of Recollect, you know, before our time at least, before Datacom IT. And it's one of the focuses um, that I've got um, in at Recollect, at um, Datacom IT rather, because I worked with Michelle uh, at Northern Beaches Library for, for some years. And I, I, while I wasn't part of the, the implementation at Recollect, I saw what went into it and the amount of hours that you spent in it. I also saw the training um, occur and, and how you felt about the training. And um, I, I guess that was a, a, a good input for me to see that all take place because I've been able to shape what we do at Datacom IT in terms of the implementation process. So we're quite clear in the um, beginning, uh, particularly in any pre-sales demonstrations, about those resources that are required um, by, by a client. Um, and also with the uh, export of data from, from, from other systems, um, yeah, again, that's something that you know, really needs to be stressed in those pre-sales pre presentations is like, um, who have you got who is going to do that for you? Because that, that is one thing that we find with clients all the time come up against that, uh, oh, well, we're going to have to enlist someone to do that for us. And we make that very clear from, from the opening that um, you need those resources to, to, to do that with. Um, I've also got a background in um, adult education, and I think one of the other aspects of what we do with Recollect is that is that training um, and enabling, um, you know, you talked about the vocabulary, uh, you know, about ingests and data and, and all those sorts of things. And uh, I try and break that down uh, during the training sessions, which also take place during the implementations for us. Um, so there's a number of things that I've tried to address uh, that I've had as feedback, largely from Northern Beach, as I'd have to say, um, to, to smooth over some of those issues that uh, have come up um, in the evolution of uh, Recollect when NZMS was first dealing with the with the product. So just wanted to sort of add add that sort of that element to it. And perhaps Michelle, you might even want to talk to some of those elements as well. I don't know, but um Thank you, Roger. Oh, we've got another question. Um, more of a question for Michelle. Are you using Recollect as a cataloging system for your local history? Do you want me to put yours up? Oh, what was our previous system? <laughs> the one everybody used. It's gone out of my head. Um, search, tech. search tech, yes. So I don't know what you had, but we had search tech and then we had the library catalogue. On our library catalogue, when they originally set it up in the in the 1980s, they put everything into the catalogue, but then that had never, ever been updated since the beginning. So we still have this leftover few things, a few maps and a few photos hovering around in the catalogue, but almost everything else is in here uh, and going forward in History Hub. We have a link on the, under that History Hub. It says the link through to the catalogue. It tells you there's ec books and our physical is in the library catalogue, and we also have physical in our offices and family history collection. So we've all got that on our front page of the website. We did try and get that whole link into Spidus where you'd link on the photo and you'd link straight in. And at the time, Spidus didn't have a program to do that. I don't know if they do now, but at the time they didn't. And they weren't very forthcoming with wanting to do it back then. Spidus aren't doing it now. No, they didn't. They wanted you to use their, their archiving system. They didn't want it to be linked in. Um, yeah. All right. Are there any further questions? Yes, there is. Okay. 
I'm going to move on from the controversial topics of uh, user experience. But thanks so much for the honesty. It's really great to see how people implement this kind of thing. You know, and those parallel systems are always a drama. We've we've got the same. It's just a it's a different different delivery method. Um, my question um, is about moderation. During COVID, were you called out for community contributions? And um, you know, Recollect lets you moderate what comes in. How did that go for you? Like, what was the experience like? So we actually controversially did not use Recollect um, to receive the submissions. Um, I found the um, format not ideal, and it was actually much easier for us to do it through the council website. So the contributions, again, Recollect was the platform to share it but the contributions were made through the council website. So that was the link that we promoted. And that had a really, really basic um, upload your file here, give us a description and nothing else. Because again, we found the language that was used on Recollect not as accessible. Plus the council website allowed us to translate it into our community languages. Um, and it was just much more accessible for us. Um, so what we did in terms of moderation, we received it from that site and then again, created every record that was one of my COVID projects to put them up then and the way that we kind of um, captured people's um, contributions was by a quote so in the description you'll find a quote of the person that submitted the photograph we did a really clear simple description of the image and put in kind of very basic metadata for each of the files um, we would love to have the community feature on Recollect and have sort of, you know, that engagement where people can comment on photographs and maybe contribute things. But at this stage, we feel like we don't have a staff member to build that community in the first place, because I think you need to kind of put time aside to actually generate some interest, have maybe in-person meetings where you train people on how to do it and to really keep that going. Um, and then again to moderate it as well. So we actually are not using the community functions at this stage. Yeah. Did you have to refuse many submissions? John and I, did you refuse many submissions? Great people in fancy. <laughs> we have encouraged you. Oh, really? I think we've got, we had a few that were like, oh, they men we mentioned before, so the notorious serial commenters, people were, sending through images of photographs and uh, trees that were cut down by council employees <laughs> in the way that they, look, this is COVID haircut of my palm tree in my you know, but nothing more than that, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, there's more questions. Sorry, I'm not have anybody's gonna. Um, I'm just interested in the, uh, in the council minutes that you're hosting there. Um, is there any, uh, does that uh, search um, search the PDF index or uh, so can you do a search within those minutes? Yes, for the typed ones they've all been OCR. Okay, so so once so once the OCR has been done, yes. okay. It becomes searchable. I, mean, I think Recollect is actually very good at that. It, it picks up sort of um, text searches at the lowest level in the actual in the PDF, so then you go to the search bar on the front. Oh, okay. And so can you then limit your search just then, say, to the council minutes rather than, yes. you know, a, a general search? Yes. So when you do a general search. If you'll see what comes up, a lot of results, 296, but you by format. Oh. Here, the Simpsons were part of the... Okay, and does that then take you to the actual page or just to the... Uh, uh, or? It depends on how well they've been OCR, to be honest. Um, we're currently working on getting some of our handwritten ones transcribed. Yeah. I think you might have to... Yeah. Sorry? Yep. Uh, Oh, okay, cool. 
just if um, for our council minutes, they're on our website, but we didn't have the money to get them put into Recollect because it's thousands and thousands of pages. So we actually have them on Search Tech, but they are connected through the Recollect site. There's a link to our council minutes and then it goes back into the old Search Tech and they're searchable there. So if you don't have enough money to bring them over in the first section, you can still link them back to Search Tech. I don't think we paid it. More controversy. <laughs> um, I just want to ask a question about the oral histories. Yes. Um, what did you use to transcribe the oral histories? Um, well, different methods. So a lot of them already had transcriptions mm -hmm. and they were done over the last 20 odd years, often by volunteers or um, interns. Um, and I know Marilyn now uses a free program called Otter. To How do you spell that? O-T-T-E-R, I think, like the animal. Um, I haven't used it myself, but she uses that to kind of get a generic dis transcription and then she can take out any errors. Um, we're also working with Ellen at the State Library um, to start using Amplify. But again, <laughs> that was a great COVID project. Now we need to actually find some time to do it um, and put stuff on there. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Next up, we have Amy from Marrickville Library. My one's just a bit of a, a light and fun YouTube video. Uh, we had a request from Slovenia Library to share what our collections were like and what kind of interesting items we held and a little bit about our team. And so, like everyone during COVID, podcasts, videos, production house, we turned into a whole different kind of a team. So we did the best we could. Um, and on, on a side topic, a lot of our History Week and Heritage Festivals became completely online programs. but. We've ended up with some really valuable videos to add into our collection and completely upskilled everyone in um, technology, as you can see how wonderful we are here today. So, <laughs> um, so let me just find this. Um, and on the topic of recollect and spiders and all of that, I think what's working really well for us at the moment is the council archives module in spiders where we have designated that module just for the council archives, so rate books, valuation books, minutes, and then we've got all our local history stuff in spiders. But we're at that point, like everyone else, looking at moving forward, how to best showcase our collections and how to create a one-stop shop. Also the challenge of amalgamated collections and harmonising and uniforming them. So yeah, a lot of, lot of fun and games really. Um, so I'll just find the YouTube. So in this video, you will see some of our prized possessions. Yeah. Hmm. I think I'll go to videos. Yeah. Oh, da, da. And yeah, it goes for about 17 minutes and we just do a little demonstration of the council archives module. So as you must probably know, we're three amalgamated councils, but prior to that, Marrickville already had about, I think, nine amalgamated councils under them. So you can imagine what our collection was like. And yeah, if you want to have coffee for five hours, I can talk all about it. <laughs> I don't know if the volume is going to work. Is uh, Carmel, is Dennis there in terms of... Um, 
just the microphone. Unless I can share. I know what. I'm not sure why the is it coming. While we're waiting for Dennis, did anyone have any questions about the Inner West local history collections? We're called Community History now. And um, but all our collections are local history within the catalogue, and and that's so that we can do contemporary collection and kind of broaden what we're collecting in a contemporary way. Um, I think I need to make myself a presenter. Add a spotlight for everyone. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I'm not sure why the audio is not working. Sharing the screen. Which one? That one. There's a play and there's no one. Let's just do it this way. So where's your thing then? It's still not playing. Get sound, yeah. Chris? Yep. Today we welcome you to a sneak peek and tour of the Inner West Community History Collection and Archives. My name is Andy Zahn, I'm the coordinator of Community History, Heritage and Archives. To begin, the Inner West Council acknowledges the traditional Aboriginal custodians of this land, their living culture and unique role in the life of this region. We acknowledge that it is a country of which the members and elders of the local Aboriginal communities have been custodians for many centuries and on which these people have performed age-old ceremonies. We will begin this presentation with an acknowledgement to country and a formal introduction 
from the Inner West Council's Aboriginal Cultural Advisor, Deborah Lennox. Legal, Nightingale Bureau Legal. Welcome, everyone, welcome. I'm a proud, adorable woman, and my name is Deborah Lennox. I'm also a local elder and the Cultural Advisor to the CEO of the Inner West Council. And I have the welcome, I have the honour of welcoming you to this broadcast today on behalf of Inner West Council and the elders of the Gadigal and Wongal peoples. The Nation is a this bordered by the Hawkesbury to the north, the Bean to the west, and Georges to the south. Within that area, 29 different languages are spoken. So hopefully, during this film, you'll learn more about history. Thank you. Vera Wagle, Lavinia, Vera Wagle. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. In 2018, the Inner West Council took a vote and adopted Aboriginal names after consultation with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. So now we have new current ward names. So we have Uludari, Leather Jacket, The Fish, as part of Balmain Ward, Gulgaria, Grass Tree, or the botanical name Xantharia. Leichhardt Ward, Darajarawong, Magpie, Ashfield Ward, Mizaburi, Lily Pilly, Marrickville Ward, Tamun, Big Tree, Stanmore Ward. Thank you. We were happy to receive your request to find out more about how we get the public and our customers to engage with the local history and community collections. Here in Australia, the history collections are referred to as local history or local studies. However, in 2018, the Inner West decided to call their collections community history, as we collect the history from the community and for the community. Our collections cover both the Council's history and community history dating back to 1860, which is roughly the beginning of many New South Wales local government areas. We are also currently collecting contemporary material reflecting what is going on around us in the present day. Community history collections are held at nine locations across the eight Inner West public libraries and one town hall. So here is the not so fancy view of the history collections. However, this is where some of our richest historical material is held in both our council archives and community archive rooms. In these rooms, we hold documents, objects, books, files, reports, ephemera, and new pieces in our contemporary community collections. We also have historical displays throughout the library that engage and grab the attention of library browsers who often further inquire about the history collections. They also want to dive into the history of their house and have a great desire to learn more about the 27 suburbs of the Inner West. Here we have a wonderful selection of our maps and plans. These ones are the original parish and ward maps that date between 1860 and 1870. They assist us in our house history and property searches as they correlate to rate books which provide valuable information about suburb development growth and naming conventions of streets and original landowners. We hold a total of 3,000 maps including subdivision plans, ward maps, suburb maps and council maps which our customers engage with for research. As they are out of copyright, they also make for wonderful designs for tea towels, cups, and other ephemeral. Yep. Here we have the architectural plans. We collect architectural plans of significant council buildings and building plans of houses from across the inner west. Again, these drawings assist us in delivering a service to our internal stakeholders, town planners, urban designers, heritage consultants, and also our external stakeholders, including heritage consultants, researchers, homeowners and students alike. We have over a thousand architectural plans in our collection. Heritage Festival and History Week. A very dynamic way of engaging the public is through our participation in the annual statewide Heritage Festival organised by the National Trust 
which has been running for 40 years. Each year we put on a series of events. There is a theme and we provide exhibitions and talks in the library and walking tours. During the COVID lockdowns, we provided these events online with a series of podcasts, live lectures, online galleries and online walking tours. In 2021, the theme was Our Heritage for the Future. We took this opportunity to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Greek independence by celebrating the Greek community in Marrickville with a book launch of Little Athens by local historian Vasilis Vasilas as well as a photographic exhibition and artist tour by local prominent photographer Emmanuel Angelicus. Emmanuel has been documenting the local Greek community for five decades. The engagement with these authors and photographers allowed the public to engage and enjoy the collections. We were also able to obtain new photographs for the collection through a cultural gifts program. History Week is organised by the New South Wales History Council. It has been running for 24 years and traditionally runs for one week at the beginning of September. For 2021, the theme was From the Ground Up. In particular, we focused on the achievements and events of an organisation called Camp Inc. And here we can see their gallery of their activities between 1971 to 2021. We took this as a great opportunity to celebrate the many and varied forms of activism by local community groups. By focusing on 1970s gay and lesbian activism, we also created a podcast. Part of our podcast included an interview with Robin Playster, a renowned activist for feminist and lesbian rights. She was also the inspiration for some national TV show called The Riot. She talks in this podcast about her life as an activist. All of this becomes really great engagement material and also videos that we can keep for the future in our collections. As mentioned earlier, we put on a range of exhibitions throughout the year for both Heritage Festival and History Week, as well as other exhibitions. Here you see some of our Industrial Heritage exhibition from September 2020 and our Emmanuel Angelicus at the New Marrickville Library. Another important part of our collections are objects which are donated by individuals in the community, as well as fellow cultural institutions and history, heritage and community groups. The history collection currently holds 1,569 items. For today's presentation, we highlight some of our favourite and unique objects. First up, we have Mick Mazza's ceramic wine holders, circa 1988. Mick Mazza was a well-known local identity who ran the bicycle shop on Marrickville Road. Here we see a set of his bespoke ceramic wine bottles. We have a set of keys for a 1930s Singer sewing machine. The unusual round object it's hard to identify at first, but in fact, it's a knife sharpener. It's Kent's patent to 199 High Holborn, London, UK. This machine consists of a shallow wooden drum fixed vertically in a cast iron frame with a horizontal axle. The frame has feet that can be screwed to a base. The cast iron turning crank has a wooden handle. There are holes and guides around the rim of the drum where knives were inserted. Here we have a 1930s dance band stage prop. This was housed at the Peterson Town Hall. My colleague Aaron will now take you on a tour of the library's web overhack and the local history landing page and council archives. Hi, I'm Aaron. I'm a member of the history team at InterWest Libraries and History Services. I'll be doing a brief video presentation on the InterWest Libraries and History catalogue or the OPAC and how we use the OPAC to engage with history customers, make our resources discoverable and promote material. So just a quick note, when we moved on to our new library system, we found that the initial version of the OPAC was not very easy for history customers and staff to use. We had a poor presentation on the catalogue and the history resources that were, available, that were able to be discovered were of little relevance to customers whilst important resources were nearly impossible to locate for customers. Over the past year, we've worked to change that, and a key aspect 
was the creation of a history focused page within the OPAC, which I'll now go through. So, on the general catalogue page, if you scroll down to the middle of the section, you'll see that there's a little section here for local history. And when you just click on local history collection, that takes you to our dedicated history page. Some of the features that we wanted to have available on the page were the ability to showcase history items that could be borrowed and reserved by our customers. Uh, we wanted to showcase newly catalogued and digitized collections. We also wanted themed photo galleries and we wanted links to key resources. So if we just scroll down a little bit, we've got a tab here called the Local History Collection for Loan. Why we have this tab is the previous version of the catalog simply had a link to search results page and to, to a search results page. The last tab that we have are the themed photo galleries. We rotate this gallery around every so often to feature different themes in our collection. Currently, we are showcasing items relating to the John Fraser Baths, which is a historic public baths which recently reopened to the public following some construction work. Other themes that we've done galleries on include public transportation and schools. The last part of the page is a sidebar area. This section basically has links to key resources and collections, starting off with our feature collection. So if I just click on the thumbnail, this will open up the tab, uh, open up the collection in a new tab, and basically customers can go off and browse the 11,000 odd pictures. Uh, if I just scroll down, I'll just open up this image, which is a sketch of a famous building in the Maracu area. So you've got the archway there. Uh, heading back to the page, uh, we then have got the waterboard plans. Uh, these are a series of plans drawn up in the 1890s which are very useful for identifying the built date of houses in the area and the general development of much of the West Council area. The previous difficulty in accessing these plans was a key concern for some customers. So the fact that we've now got them very easy to access is a real win for, for us as a service. Scrolling down a little bit more, some of our collection including our oil history collection, is actually hosted on an external catalogue called uh, Indie Reads. So we can now easily link to that, and then I'll just open up Indie Reads into a new uh, tab. So here we go, here's some of our uh, former, uh, some of our, oh, so these are some of the oil histories that customers can uh, listen and download. Earlier on, we talked about History Week. But this year for History Week, uh, we actually set up a page on the OPAC as well to help highlight collection items that match the theme of History Week 2021, as well as explain what History Week was and link to the program. And the good thing about this is we can actually archive this page, so we can consult this in the future if we just want to remember what we did last year, or if a customer remembers vaguely what we did last year and wants to revisit it. So that's a really cool thing. And basically it sort of follows the theme of the general page. So we've got a couple of containers from the ground up. Um, the left, which is an organization in the Leichhardt area. And then some general pictures of activism in the NRS. And we've also got an embedded YouTube uh, video regarding a particular subject. The last link that we have is for the Council Archives. So if we click on this link, this will take customers to the um, links for the various former uh, local councils that make up the NRS Council. And from here, customers can click through these links and basically view uh, digitized council records, mainly uh, great records, which helps uh, customers identify built date of houses um, and also family history, where, where family members lived and, and all that kind of stuff. The Inner West has a very rich industrial heritage coming out of the 19th century life. The Inner West was home to many founding companies that assisted in Sydney's development, from shipyards and docks to power stations car manufacturers such as General Motors, Assembly Plant, 
brick pits and brick makers, industrial ceramics, piano factories, toy factories, rocking horse makers, engineering companies, steamship companies, flour mills, leather turneries, hat factories, woolen mills, um, such as the well-known Vickers Woolen Mill in Marrickville, brass founders for plumbing, margarine companies, cordial factories, aircraft equipment, and this is just to name a few. In order to engage the public with the industrial heritage, we created online walking tours with audio narration, which can be accessed all year round at the convenience of the public as individuals or as a group. We also put on exhibitions, displays and talks. For example, when we put on the exhibition Made in Marrickville Then and Now, we traced the social, creative and economic history over three eras of ceramic design. Beginning at the heyday of Bowler Ceramics, which operated between 1860 and 1920, Studio Emma, 1952 to 1980, and then looking at the survival tactics of small-scale independence creative working today in Marrickville, such as Mud Ceramics. We interviewed their director, Shelley Simpson, and we also interviewed independent artists like Millie Dent. This exhibition and talk was a good example of how we, in the library service, are able to connect local professionals with the Community Histories Collection. Thank you for joining us today. So from the Inner West Community History team, we would like to thank you for this opportunity to share some insights into our collections, some of the exhibitions and the online access. We wish you all the best in your future endeavours. Yep. Just a little sneak peek. <laughs> um, yeah, if you have any questions for our team, uh, please feel free to come and talk to us and thank you all for coming to Marrickville Library today. I hope you've enjoyed it and enjoyed the history tour of the site, the old hospital. It's a very unique library with a very unique story in anyone's books in a very unique suburb as well. And as you can see, we have eight libraries, 27 suburbs, 200,000 people population. So it's a lot you can imagine from a local history point of view to engage with. So there's years of work here. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming. Yes. Yep. I think you were spent up a local history hub in one of your one of your areas. Is that Tom? What do you mean? A local history hub or service at Petersham Town? Oh yeah, yeah. So at St Peter's, we were looking. We did do a big survey in two thousand and eighteen about decent um, having staff at satellite locations or centralising the collection. We just couldn't see that people from Balmain were going to make their way over to St Peter's or Marrickville or even come on this side of Parramatta Road. So we've strategically put the four staff in key four positions, so we're a bit of a pillar service. Um, it kind of works. Uh, nothing's perfect. And um, yeah, so we've got one staff member based at Ashfield, one at Leichhardt, uh, one at Marigville and St Peter's. So, yeah, we're a very diverse and eclectic uh, team there. Yeah. I'd just like to thank Amy and her wonderful team for all the work you've done. This week. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank my co committee, um, Marilyn and Ellen, for all the work they've done in creating the program today. And I'd just like to remind you that the next meeting, we're aiming to have a regional meeting in November. So we haven't, we haven't found a place yet, have we? We've got a sort of place yet, but we have a short list of folks that are people who want to volunteer, please follow. Go ahead and volunteer. Um, so we've got one talk already for 10 slides in five minutes coming up in November. And anyone else who wants to present, <laughs> I won't forget. Anyone else who wants to present, please let us know. If you want to join the committee, please do so. We're happy to have more people on the committee. But um, thank you all so much for coming along. And um, remember to keep using the e e e list um, email because it's working really well at the moment. 
and there's been some great, great questions and requests for help. So keep doing it. And remember, the wiki is up and running, so have a look at it at some stage if you want. But thanks again, and thanks for your help, Ellen. It's much appreciated.